I wanted to address some few housekeeping uh, concepts real fast. Uh, we do hope that everybody keeps their mics on mute. This is more of a, a presentation. We will have a, a Q&A session at the end. So uh, feel free to put your questions into the chat as you think of them as we're going through. And we'll make sure that we uh, go through that and, and answer those um, and, uh, and be able to uh, address those in the Q&A session afterward. So um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Miriam Lynch, the Executive Director of Diversity in Aquatics, and uh, to talk a little bit more about the organization and, and how you can get involved. Hi, and thank you, Anesti, and thank you, Michael, for being a part of our webinar series that we host every month um, as a part of Diversity in Aquatics. And welcome all everybody from all over. Um, I see that we have almost 40 people online with us right now, which is amazing to see and to learn about um, a career pathway through SCUBA. We are Diversity in Aquatics, and we are an organization of over 2,000 members that are all working towards water safety education and promoting healthy aquatic activity, especially in vulnerable populations. For us, we have a three-pronged approach. We work to educate, we work to promote, and we work to support aquatic agencies across the wide spectrum of, of aquatics, from learn to swim all the way to career pathways such as scuba that we're learning about today. Um, we have as our governing and how you can get involved. Um, we are getting ready to launch our new website and membership platform. Right now, our membership is for free um, and that there's a whole host of information about uh, different aquatic areas and where you can network with one another on your membership. Uh, so that's the first tier and how you can get involved. Second tier and how you can get involved is through actions like this with our aquatic councils. We have seven different aquatic councils that are part of diversity in aquatics. We, one of them is SCUBA. We also have triathlons who hosted um, a webinar recently, HBCU HSIs, which is historically black colleges and universities and Hispanic serving institutions also hosted a webinar last month. Uh, we also have, um, a Caribbean Council, we have a Competitive Swim Council, um, and more that you can be involved with diversity in aquatics. We are also looking for volunteers. We are a 100% volunteer organization, meaning that each of us wear dual hats. So um, for us, all of that we receive as a nonprofit goes straight back into our programming and to be able to host events like this and our annual convention that's getting ready to be run. So we're always looking for volunteers to help us with hosting webinars, um, organizing our convention, um, and a whole slew of other operational items uh, for us. Uh, I'm very thankful to see a number of our our volunteer staff on here uh, that is a part of this webinar and that have been such instrumental in our growth these last few years. For us at Diversity in Aquatics, we are, we are on the national level to address uh, the water safety and healthy aquatic activities across the spectrum, as we said, as I said earlier. And it cannot be done without the people that you see our council chairs, um, such as Anesti, and also uh, the people behind the scenes, such as Martha and Thaddeus and Janina. So I really am thankful for this host of people who are able to support the organization and carry out its mission um, to make sure that aquatics is enjoyed by all and that all can see that it all starts with learning to swim, but the pathways are great um, and fruitful. So without any further ado, I would like to say thank you and turn it over to our council chair, Anesti, for the rest of our webinar. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Miriam. I want to kind of uh, give a, a brief overview of the SCUBA Council and what we do at Diversity and Aquatics. Um, it, it's been around for quite some time. It's, it's being uh, reinvigorated, I guess you could say, uh, in a lot of ways since I uh, took up the position in uh, June or July, sometime during COVID, the height of COVID. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but at Scuba Council, we, we understand that swimming is our base and that's why it makes a lot of sense for us to, to run operations the way we do with 
diversity in aquatics um, to address the, the swimming disparities um, that Miriam had mentioned uh, around what diversity in aquatics does. And knowing that um, once people learn how to swim, they may want to do something more with that. And that's why we have triathlon and scuba. Um, and one of the challenges that we're facing uh, uh, in the scuba community as a whole, especially in terms of its ethnic, racial, and, and socioeconomic diversity, is the financial barriers to scuba diving. And so we're looking at ways to expand accessibility to scuba, uh, partnering with organizations and programs uh, for grant funds, governmental, private, uh, just running the gamut and just really a focus on increasing accessibility to scuba, especially for those who want to leverage it for its therapeutic modalities uh, or to find a career in marine sciences, which is predominantly the focus uh, this evening with Michael and I uh, around how scuba diving really inspired us to follow that path. And so we are looking for new people uh, to be part of the scuba council. So you don't even have to be scuba certified. You just have to have an interest in scuba and to be able to provide uh, a lot of good feedback about uh, ideas you may have and just be part of a brainstorming process around what are some calls to action that we can take as a scuba council to increase that accessibility, expand the nonprofit sector uh, of scuba is one of the ways we're really focused on right now and, uh, and just make it accessible to everyone as a fun activity, as a career path, as a therapeutic modality, and just be able to meet it where they're at. And that's, that's Scuba Council. Uh, I am really excited because uh, this, is our scuba, this is our first webinar as a Scuba Council uh, under my leadership. And so forgive me if I stumble a little bit, I'm a little nervous, this is, this is really exciting. Uh, I've done a number of these uh, in different capacities for uh, speaking on my experience. Uh, I just did one last week at UC Davis, Coastal and Marine Sci uh, Science Institute. Um, thanks to my colleague Priya Shukla there. Um, it was pretty awesome. And, um, you know, but to be able to kind of speak on it in a way that provides calls to action for a much larger community um, is something really exciting and really aligns with my morals and values about how I feel scuba can help others. With that said, I'd like to uh, kind of give you a brief overview of how this evening's uh, webinar is going to go. We're going to start off with some background introductions. Michael is going to go first, and um, he's provided this awesome PowerPoint, which mine does not hold a candle to, but um, he's going to talk a little bit about his journey uh, into where he is now. I'll do the same. Those will be about 10 minutes each, maybe a little less, and then we're going to cover a few topics. Those topics are um, uh, navigating the field of marine science uh, as a person of color. Um, and the scuba world, and there's a lot of overlap, and we can talk about that as well. Um, what organizations can do to help increase accessibility to scuba, especially as a tool um, in building a career path off of. Um, what employers can do uh, for marine science-based um, positions. And then what you can do if you wanna get involved in various ways. And then uh, after that, we'll have uh, at least a 20 to 30 minute Q&A session. We'll start to go through the questions in the chat first. And then uh, if we happen to run out, we'll definitely take some live questions uh, as well. All right. With that said, I would like to turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Michael Dorian Acid. Thank you, Anesti. Thank you, Diversity and Aquatics. I'm happy to be here. Um, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen for you. everybody see it okay? Yes, we see it. Okay. Yes. Great. Oops. Oh. All righty. So um, as Anessi just mentioned before, uh, the main topic that both of our both of us are going to talk about is shaping a career path through adventures in scuba diving. And this is my adventure right here for you. So here's a little bit about uh, background and about me. Um, I'm half Filipino and half uh, African-American. I hail from St. Louis, Missouri, pretty landlocked. So if you're wondering how a boy like me got into scuba, you're about to find out. <laughs> um, I have a pretty unique educational background um, from 
an associate's degree in fashion design where I studied at FITM in Los Angeles um, to a bachelor's degree from St. Louis, Missouri, where I double majored in international business and uh, marketing with a minor in French and a master's of arts in international environmental policy within, with a focus in sustainability management and French as well too, from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies here in Monterey, California. That's pretty much what brought me back here to California. Um, I'm a nerd, so I love to learn and I think you should always be evolving. So um, I was like in school for the last 10 years and um, I loved every minute of it. I pretty much filled my head, it's like a sponge and everything. So, um, but if you want to go into this field an environmental field or marine field, I don't recommend taking this route, <laughs> but, um, but I've been able to make it uh, work for uh, my unique situation. And so without further ado, let's dive into my journey. <laughs> um, a little bit about my dive background. Um, I am currently a Patty Dive, uh, Patty dive Master uh, with intentions of becoming an instructor at some point. I have over 180 plus dives, uh, mainly in the California region through uh, work, volunteering and recreation since I live in a dive Mecca in Monterey. So while 25% uh, of my dives have been in the warm waters of Madagascar, uh, which we'll talk about later. And I am an American Academy of Underwater Sciences trained scientific diver as well. Um, if you want to know where uh, people dive near Missouri, um, it's in Mermet Springs, Illinois. So uh, it's pretty much a, a, I think it was a limestone quarry and when they were done with the quarry, they filled it up with water. And now uh, all that's there is like some, some old cars, a motorcycle, a bus that you can go like check out and view when you're diving. Um, there's a sunken plane that's in there and a catfish that loves to eat hot dogs. <laughs> that's like one of the tourist attractions there to have the divers go there and feed them hot dogs. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so um, here's my journey here. Um, my interest in diving started when uh, I joined the Navy to originally become a Navy diver. I passed the Navy diver preparatory course in Great Lakes, Michigan, but I did not pass the real training in uh, Panama City, Florida. So I was then redesignated as a aviation maintenance administration man for the duration of my uh, Naval career. There I caught the travel bug as we visited Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Japan, um, Guam as well too. And I spent about 14 months of my life in total um, on a aircraft carrier. So one of the largest ships in the world, um, one of the most uh, um, technical and, and uh, uh, abundant ships as well too. There's a lot of people on it. I think it can house like 5,000 people on them. Um, yeah, and I did that from right out of high school from 2006 to 2010. And when I left the Navy, I went straight to fashion school in Los Angeles. Um, I had such high hopes for a career um, in that field until I learned of all the like terrible and destructive like things that go into making clothes, especially in regard to the environment. Um, things that they pretty much don't teach you in fashion school. So I ended up studying abroad a couple of times in France and was even sponsored by the Japanese government to go to Japan or to live in Tokyo for nine days uh, through their Kakahashi program. Um, I studied abroad one final time during my undergrad in Guyana to fulfill my science requirement. And it's pretty much where my interest in the environment started uh, as I realized how much I enjoyed being in the field and uh, out in nature. Which led me to scientific diving in Madagascar. So when I graduated with my bachelor's, I wanted to do something crazy as my last hurrah before committing to becoming a proper adult. <laughs> so I decided to finally follow through with uh, getting scuba certified to do marine conservation in Madagascar. I got my initial certifications um, and pretty much just dove into scientific diving, both literally and figuratively, in one of the most beautiful and biodiverse regions on the planet. I lived here for two months where I volunteered for an organization called Frontier, um, 
there we use trans there I use transex a quadrat and um, was transported on a boat that flooded way too often to be considered safe <laughs> all for the first time in my life um, I absolutely loved what I was doing and remembered doing an underwater survey and thinking to myself, I need to get paid to do this. <laughs> like, this would be awesome as a career. And unfortunately, I couldn't find the drive that had all of my Madagascar photos and videos. So if you want to check out my Instagram later or something, go ahead. I'll have uh, the contact information at the end. So to convince myself that I was serious about um, this field and uh, to future employers, I continued my diving journey onto the professional side and got my dive master um, in that quarry that I mentioned before. I knew I wanted to do research diving when I returned to California and discovered that the place I got accepted for grad school was a dive mecca here in Monterey, California. Um, my school had an agreement um, with neighboring universities for free classes or to audit free classes so of course I took the scientific diving course at CSUMB where I completed my 100 hours of uh, required scientific diving training and met one of my future bosses at uh, Reef Check. And this is pretty much where I started the transition into a, a career shift um, that I had in mind. So to gain experience, I interned at Reef Check um, during the summer of 2019 um, and ReefCheck is an international environmental organi NGO with a chapter in California that focuses on kelp forest monitoring and assessing California's reef health, reef health through uh, marine protected area monitoring. And this was an incredibly like rewarding experience that helped me launch my career in the environmental field. And another thing that I enjoyed about this organization was it helped me find a community that shared passion, the environmental passion that I had and the diving passion as well too. And I built some very valuable relationships and friendships there as well. And it also continued my experience um, with marine conservation. And I did some amazing dives up and down the coast of California. Um, I had access to sites that not regular divers actually do. And I was a part of a grand citizen science program that is worldwide that has done so many things for my career and got me so involved, um, uh, provided so many adventures for me and helped me, uh, like I said, build a very valuable uh, network. This is also where I met Anesti um, through the US sex uh, organization. Um, because they sponsored me to do this trip uh, with Reef Check during the summer um, for the eco expedition that they have annually. So here's a little video of me in action. Now, um, to stay on top of my game, I sharpened my scientific diving skills <clears throat> through surveys, um, removing and installing temperature monitors for Reef Checks. Uh, climate change monitoring program and by mastering my environment and um, knowing and understanding the fish that I swim with, the invertebrates that I survey, and the macroalgae that we're always swimming through and that and the famous uh, and one of the giant one of the macroalgae that Monterey is famous for, um, the giant kelp. Um, with Reef Check, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to identify more than 80 plus like marine species. So that pretty much kept me on top of my game in this field as well too. And uh, in this video here, you can see me swapping out one of those um, temperature monitors as one of the uh, oceanographic instruments that uh, ReefCheck uses as well too. <laughs> All right, there we go. All righty, so after this internship, I pretty much solidified the fact that I wanted to be in the environmental field. And um, I had the, ex I gained the experience that I needed. I sharpened the skills that I wanted to uh, work on. And I became a better diver as well too. So I had a lot of mentorship um, underneath my boss at Reef Check um, with diving as well too. And 
when I decided that I wanted to do this career shift, I learned of a uh, triple bottom line approach that some environmentally focused corporations use um, in order to measure uh, their sustainability. Um, but for me personally, I adapted this approach in determining what I wanted out of a career. And this pretty much solidified that I wanted to be in the environmental protection field and I wanted to do it with diving. Um, and instead of, but when I use the triple bottom line approach, instead of measuring sustainability, I use it to measure like happiness. So um, I replaced the, it's the, the triple bottom line approach is uh, planet, people and profit. And I substituted the environment, uh, pretty much um, environmental protection. That's the field that I wanted to be in. Um, the people would have been me and then um, income wise. So that's as far as sustainability for me too. It's gotta be something sustainable that I need to do um, in order to pretty much be 100% happy. And um, I was able to find just that. <laughs> I landed a job as an environmental scientist and a scientific diver, and I couldn't be happier. Um, I graduated May this year, and I've been working with this company for about a year as an on-call, and they picked me up, and I'm excited to work with some future projects that we have coming up, and that's pretty much my journey here. Um, I'd like to thank Diversity in Aquatics again, uh, Anesti as well, and for ReefCheck for help launching my career. Here's some um, contact information if you guys have any personal questions that you'd like to ask me. And then from here, I'm gonna turn it over to Anesti. All right, thank you, Michael. That was, uh, that was awesome. I learned a few things about you that I didn't know. So <laughs> that was really cool, man. Um, hopefully we get a lot of questions about uh, a little bit more about our path. Um, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and share a little bit of uh, my background as well, uh, just to help give some context to some of the things we're talking about and, uh, and uh, that um, our backgrounds help make well-informed decisions about. Um, so give me a second here. I will go ahead and share my screen. All right. So this is me. Uh, that is uh, the very first uh, scuba selfie I took in Monterey. If you can see, there's a uh, light uh, silhouettes of the, the kelp there in the background. And this was back in 2014 when visibility around Monterey was collectively uh, a little better. Uh, but I, I heard it's getting better now. I, uh, I want to start with my childhood. I, um, I'm indigenous. I'm a member of the Tupinamba tribe of Brazil. Uh, but I was born here in America. My mother and my grandmother are all from Brazil. In fact, shortly after I was born, I moved back to Brazil, lived there for like a year or two and came back. And then my mom um, met my stepdad who is Greek. So we moved to Greece for like a year because that's what Greeks do, I guess. Um, and then when we came back, uh, I lived in New York for a year in Astoria, Queens. Uh, that's where I learned how to speak English. So uh, people tell me when I get a little irritated or a little mad, um, I get a New York accent that starts to come out. Um, but for the most part, it's like easy, chill, Florida, uh, California mix of, uh, of kind of vernacular. So um, I, I did have a really rough childhood, though, despite like what seems like really awesome experiences on paper around really early childhood travel. Um, my, my stepfather was uh, an alcoholic and physically abusive to my mom and I. And, um, and it, it was rough. Uh, at one point, um, my mother um, had gotten hooked on drugs and I was put in a foster home uh, for almost two years from like uh, seven to nine. Um, got placed back with my family, uh, but it was still very rough. And uh, I ended up becoming homeless by the time I was 16. It was a, a big part to do with the fact that my stepdad wanted me to drop out of high school to come work for him full time. And I didn't really have a clear head on my shoulders. I already had like a, a semblance of PTSD at that point from all the trauma of uh, physical and emotional abuse. But I knew that education was going to be my ticket out of there. That That's all I knew, like deep in my heart. And so I didn't want to drop out uh, and uh, I got kicked out. Um, thankfully, I was privileged enough to have a car at the time. 
Um, it was like an 84 Datsun Maxima before Nissan bought it. Like if, yeah. And uh, I, um, I slept in the back seat of it for like five months until a friend of a friend of a friend uh, in, there in high school um, had found out and went home, talked to her mom and they invited me over and talked to me, kind of got a feel for who I am and what my focus was and said, look, as long as you keep your nose clean, keep, stay in school and graduate on time, you can stay with us as, as long as you need to, to help get your life together. And, uh, and I'm immensely thankful to them, this, the Smith family, Amanda Smith and, and her family um, for taking me in to, um, to allow me the space to be able to continue school and graduate. Um, things were still obviously kind of rough, uh, but I, I was able to graduate on time and the army was looking really appealing. I had like some ideas around joining it. I was in high school ROTC, army ROTC in high school. And so I was kind of mulling it over and, and I was at a period in my life where I needed stability. I was really craving that. And the army was like, hey, we'll feed you every day. Uh, we'll put a roof over your head and, uh, and you'll be good to go. And that's, that's where my focus was. So I, I joined the army. Um, I joined in 2000. So to give you some context, that was actually obviously before 9-11. So we were not a country that was at war. Uh, we had no major conflicts going on. We had some minor peace keeping, peace enforcement operations at the time. Um, I joined as an infantryman um, because that's what young men who need to prove themselves, <laughs> uh, you know, sign up to be, I guess. Um, and so uh, my very first deployment, I get to my first duty station at the 101st Airborne Division, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I'm deployed to Kosovo in the peace enforcement operation between Serbians and Albanians there um, uh, under the NATO flag. I, I get back, 9-11 happens, and that just changed everything forever. Um, within a few months after 9-11, I was part of the first main body infantry combat brigade uh, into Afghanistan. Um, there were already Navy SEALs and um, Marine Force Recon, um, a couple of Green Berets and, and um, some other field operatives um, under SOCOM that were there in, in country. Um, but we were the first combat infantry brigade uh, there into Afghanistan uh, in Kandahar. Uh, the first tour was, was relatively okay. We, we had some minor skirmishes. The second tour was really rough though. That's where Taliban were able to reinforce um, uh, they were talking like 2002, so about a year later uh, after we invaded Afghanistan um, to, um, for them to kind of reinforce. And that's where things got really tough. And in that second tour, um, my convoy, uh, Humvee convoy was uh, attacked with an RPG and um, I had uh, shrapnel embedded in my eye and uh, it shredded the muscles that contract to move your eye left or right. So I lost full peripheral vision in my left eye and a, a majority of my hearing in my left ear. And so the army in its ever endless, uh, you know, love and, and compassion for its soldiers said, hey, we're not gonna medically discharge you. We're just gonna give you a different job since you're not qualified to be infantry anymore. Um, so I was reclassified to uh, intelligence analyst. I was assigned to seven special forces groups. So there went my cushy desk job that I thought I was gonna have uh, as an intel analyst. And, um, and each uh, special forces group has an area of operations around the world. And our uh, seventh group is Central and South America. And we we specialize in guerrilla warfare. So we worked with the Colombian army training militia groups in guerrilla warfare to help fight against uh, cartels and the growth of uh, drug cartels in Colombia there. And so um, that was my, my military experience. Um, Post-military adjustment, I, I really want to destigmatize PTSD, especially amongst veterans. Um, it, it's one of those things that I, I wish somebody had shared with me when I got out, because when I got out, I thought uh, any sort of mental challenges, um, you know, uh, cognitive challenges like PTSD or the TBI that I had suffered that went misdiagnosed or undiagnosed, I wish somebody would have really talked to me fully like on a, on, in a way that helped normalize it because um, I still had that very strong machismo about, oh, I'm, I'm a man and I'm not allowed to, to feel that way. I'm not allowed to talk about my feelings. I'm just fine. I came back with uh, all four limbs, 10 fingers, 10 toes. You know, I'm not an amputee. Um, my eye got messed up a little bit, but I'm still functional. And so I'm fine. And there was no emphasis on mental health at all. 
And so I really want to normalize that because that was a struggle for me for, for some time. Um, I, I was in a position where I didn't care if I lived or died. Uh, I wasn't uh, inherently suicidal uh, for, for all of that time period um, for a couple of years after I got out, but I was just, uh, you know, I, I just didn't have a focus on myself, my self-worth and my, and my future. Um, I did, however, get involved in filmmaking. I started to start training again with a martial arts school that I was involved with back in high school. And I, um, I was just kind of hanging out with them. We were training in martial arts and around 2005, YouTube launched and people started uploading videos and videos were like this big new big thing on the internet. And, you know, um, the instructor Maurice came to me and was like, Hey, Anesti, you're good with like computers and stuff like that. Like, uh, you want to shoot some of our, our, you know, fight demos that we put together and put some videos together. And I'm like, sure. Cause that's the same thing. Um, computers and, and filmmaking, but I, luckily I did have a home video camcorder and, uh, we started choreographing some really cool concepts, uh, started mimicking some stuff we saw in movies and started building off of that using Maurice's approach to martial arts and putting some really cool stuff together. And, um, started making a name for myself as a, a cinematographer of sorts uh, in filmmaking. I shot a couple of videos that um, some of our uh, friends were in, like Dave Batista, who's a big WWE wrestler turned Hollywood movie star now uh, with Guardians of the Galaxy and a bunch of other movies. And, um, and so that video went viral because Maurice was his personal trainer. And that kind of helped launch a, a filmmaking career of sorts. So although I wouldn't call it a career because I, I didn't have a focus on my future. I was just like, um, just kind of taking things as they went and ideas were being pitched to me. I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. And then I just did it. And then I started being a little more proactive around 2009, 2010, started shooting my own film projects, winning some awards uh, at some film festivals, getting some, some notoriety, but I, I still felt like something was missing and I, I, I started to get good at it, but I, I didn't enjoy it. It was like, it just, it was just something that was like, all right, this is cool. And I met lots of cool people and, but it was just, uh, I felt like something was missing. Uh, apart from my, my advancing career in filmmaking, I was an adrenaline junkie. Uh, like I had mentioned before, I didn't care if I lived or died. I, I was involved in skydiving and these relatively safe you know, activities um, like MMA fighting, uh, skydiving, fencing, archery and things like that. But I just, um, I was always looking for that adrenaline fix. You know, and that's that's uh, what I hear is something very common amongst veterans post service, is um, you know civilian life just uh, just doesn't excite them the way the way that uh, things were in the military, and especially in combat. And so, um, you know, I, I was involved in a lot of activities that had like inherent risks, and I thought that my next activity um, was my next adrenaline filled activity was going to be diving with sharks, and uh, and so I, I put that on the agenda. But uh, at the end of the day, um, I was still in a place where, um, you know, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you guys aren't familiar, um, this is this is for a, a, a normal, uh, well-adjusted human being, right? But for someone with PTSD, this this looks like a jumbled piece of paper, you know, for us uh, uh, in in different ways because we're all unique, and so we all have different unique. Um, coping mechanisms to PTSD as well. But for, for me, uh, especially post-service, uh, uh, my, my base needs weren't being met. Um, you know, I, I had, you know, air, food and water. A shelter was kind of rough, you know, locking down some housing, uh, you know, and I was, I was at risk of being homeless a couple of times again, uh, post-military service. Um, but when I got involved with scuba diving, it was, it was something that, really changed my life. And I really attribute scuba diving to saving my life in a way, because it was a huge turnaround for me. And I, I was able to kind of uh, clear my mind and have some focus. Um, I had mentioned training in the martial arts before, and a lot of the styles have like meditative components to them. And um, so I've been to like Buddhist temples and, and other like uh, meditation periods where my friends would sit for hours, and they'd come out of it all Zen, like, feeling like, you know, they've just been reborn, like, oh, this was amazing. And Nesty, how do you feel? And I'm like, yeah, that was cool. You know, I, I my ankles hurt now from sitting that long that way, but you know, I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> Cause like, I couldn't like, it just, it's just white noise, just white noise that like, you can't ever clear your mind. Um, 
and, and just and just think clearly. And and I, I didn't know what I didn't know about what that was supposed to feel like until the very second I became neutrally buoyant in water. It just it just dawned on me. It was like that 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 coming to your creator moment where it was just like, wow, like this is, you know, this is what it must have felt like for my friends to meditate in these, in these Buddhist temples or in these other, you know, uh, meditative sessions that, that we had uh, uh, undergone, like just the, the physiological effects of your body underwater uh, coupled with like this hypervigilant sense of awareness around breathing and body position and, and movement in this, in this three fully three dimensional space now, um, you know, where, where you can move up or down, you know, as, as if you're floating. Um, it just, uh, it has strong, like, healing properties, I feel. And, and there's a lot of studies around the therapeutic effects of uh, neutral buoyancy that I'll talk a little bit more about with, uh, with Dive Heart. But um, these, um, uh, the, you know, and, and, and that, that was the turning point for me. So scuba diving didn't really, like, fix all my problems by any means, but it, it allowed me to, to feel its, its healing and therapeutic effects for me to be able to get a clear focus on my sense of self, um, my sense of self-worth and value as a person, and be able to have an idea of what my future could look like. Uh, right around that time, I had um, moved to California uh, shortly after getting scuba certified. So the bulk of my scuba diving career has been based in California. Um, as it stands now, I have, uh, I just, uh, was in Blue Grotto this last weekend, um, doing a Patty to Naui crossover instructor course. And, um, I think that accounted for like my 800th and 12th and 813th, uh, dives. Uh, so I have a little over 800 dives, um, uh, a mix between scientific recreational, uh, and, uh, training, uh, in terms of, uh, myself as an instructor training students. Um, I became an instructor in California. Um, and that was kind of wild because my, when I first moved there, my wife was finishing her last year at Sonoma State University with a, a bachelor's in fine arts and um, Chicano Latino studies there in the North Bay. And she took me out to Bodega Bay and I put my toe in California water for the first time ever. And I freaked out like who in their right mind dives this water? Well, come to find out a whole bunch of awesome badasses do. And I've come to meet a lot of them, uh, especially through Reef Check, which was my next step in uh in my diving career uh before i became an instructor and reef check like michael had mentioned is a it's a it's an organization that brings volunteers of scuba divers together for to to dive with a purpose i know diving with a purpose is another organization but that's actually the tagline of, of reef check and so um i just uh i just knew i wanted to do something cool with um oh somebody's drawing all over my presentation all right um I just knew I wanted to do something cool with scuba diving. And, uh, and I heard through the dive shop that I was working out of about reef check and, and got connected with Dan Abbott, um, who was an awesome instructor and, and taught me a lot about um, California's kelp forest. And, uh, and through that networking, I met like Tristan McHugh, who's been an amazing mentor of mine and really helped shape um, what my career path could look like in marine sciences with a lot of her mentorship and insight. So I, I shout out to her. I think she's on. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Selena McMillan too. I met her on the 2018 Big Sur expedition. She's the SoCal regional manager. And she, I didn't get to talk to her a whole lot. So we don't really know each other like really well, but I'm in awe of her too. She's, she's a badass and was just, uh, and I was just amazed by all these people who just kind of dive in what I consider pretty austere environment relative to scuba diving in Florida um, with, with just no hesitation, just like, this is what it is. And this is what we're gonna do. And uh, I love that attitude and it, it really bring, brought me forward. Um, when I moved to California, I, I had gotten out of the world of filmmaking and got involved in um, nonprofit work and us utilizing my filmmaking and digital media skills to really help strengthen the voices of nonprofit organizations, especially in community health and public health. And that was going well for a time until the, the last two full-time positions that I held um, uh, a year apart from each other back to back, I was laid off. Um, and, and it was like, you know, it's like bureaucratic uh, excuses around budget cuts and stuff. But in reality, I was replaced with someone who was fresh out of college who can create digital media content without it, uh, without the experience and knowledge and know-how of 
of uh, a larger structure that aligned with the organization's strategic goals. That's where my value really lied, where I had a lot of experience in. Um, and uh, and that was that was kind of rough for me. And it was around the same time I was introduced to a VA program um, called, uh, at the time it was called Vocational Rehabilitation and Employment. Now it's Veteran Readiness and Employment um, to be able to go back to school. And, um, and I had never really gone to college. I know I was promised college in the army. They never gave you time while you're in. That was a big lie by the recruiters. And I, um, and I just wasn't in the right place, the right mindset uh, until, until the last you know, three or four years of my life to be able to say, you know, I, I could go back to school. But it, what was unique about it was right at that time, I was mulling over, do I wanna continue in this career path in digital media? Or do I want to go back to school for something that I'm much more passionate about, like the ocean, and uh, and do more with that? And um, and I had reached out to an organization called USX, and that somebody told me about at the vet center, and they said, hey, we do expeditions, um, mostly mountaineering, but I know they have a few ocean-related stuff on their wish list. You know, reach out. So I had reached out, connected with them, and I thought I was just like just kind of giving my pitch to be part of a team somewhere to do something cool. Uh, similar to what I was doing in Reef Check. And, um, and at the end of it all, they're like, no, 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 you, you misunderstand. We didn't call you to be part of the team. We would like you to launch our ocean research program under the USX banner. And I was like, okay. Um, a day that ends in Y and being way in over my head, but saying yes anyway, because that's what I do. And uh, and so, yeah, I launched the program. I, I partnered with ReefCheck immediately. That was my crutch because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. And ReefCheck's like, don't worry, we got you. Let's let's put together a ReefCheck uh, training and and bring veterans out to ReefCheck Florida. We'll get you connected with some people out there. And it all ended up really going really smooth. Thanks in large part to our partnership uh, with ReefCheck. And we've launched a, a number of programs there. Um, for me, I once the first expedition happened with Coral Reef Research in Florida, I was immediately promoted to director of operations where I ran strategic planning and logistics for all of our operations, uh, like the Juno Icefield Trek, um, Big Sur that Michael uh, Acid was on, um, our, our assistance with the launch of a scientific research uh, submarine vessel in Monterey that um, Michael and I did together. Um, shark research in, in Florida and so many others. And so um, uh, about a year later, the organization's CEO who started at the time had uh, a lot of other like priorities and um, had talked it over with the board of directors and they voted unanimously to vote me in as executive director and to hand the organization over to me. So this is not even an adopted baby. Like this is, this is me like just kind of babysitting. And now I'm, I've adopted this baby and it's mine. And I've, I'm running this whole organization now. Um, not much is happening with it because we're, we're in uh, COVID obviously. Um, but, you know, I, I really want to give a shout out to USX, um, NAWI, um, which is a nonprofit certification agency. Um, all the agencies like PADI, SSI, SDI, they're all great. They're all amazing in different ways. It's really more about the instructor than the organization anyway. But for me, NAWI at its core as a 501c3 um, really aligns with my values as a, a scuba diver um, to increase accessibility um, through the nonprofit structure. Um, getting connected with diversity and aquatics was uh, something that happened earlier this year. Um, I just felt like people of color in the scuba diving community really kind of needed a space. So I created a group called Divers of Color on Facebook and um, sent it over to Diversity and Aquatics to see if they wanted to share. And then within a couple of days, Miriam Lynch, our executive director is like, would you like to be scuba council chair? <laughs> and I said, sure, again, because you know I, I never can say no to cool opportunities like that. And then with Dive Heart, which is an organization that uses scuba to um, connect people with cognitive and physical disabilities to the therapeutic effects of scuba diving. And so we use adaptive techniques um, modified um, with, with, uh, with assistance through evaluations and whatnot to get folks in the pool uh, and perhaps even all the way to scuba certification depending on their evaluation. So we do a lot of really cool stuff around accessing, uh, increasing accessibility to scuba um, through Dive Heart. And uh, I'm this close to finishing my instructor training with, with Dive Heart as well. And, um, and that kind of brings me full circle to like going back to school. Like that was, um, that decision happened about a year and a half ago. 
I'm now just completed my first semester at the Florida Institute of Technology um, with a double major, um, because of course, why not? Uh, in oceanography and strategic communications, kind of bring uh, everything full circle between my filmmaking and digital media background, uh, together with my love for, for ocean sciences to be a science, an ocean science communicator. And so um, that's really working out well so far. Uh, I love my first semester. I met lots of amazing people, a lot of great opportunities already. I launched the Florida Tech Scuba Club uh, this first semester because I don't have enough on my plate. And, uh, and that's been going really well too. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and just, just uh, always around um, helping like-minded people come together through scuba diving. And so my main focus of my career is I want to build accessibility for anybody who wants to do what they want to do. And, it, in, and for me, it's scuba diving. And, and sometimes I can come across a little cultish and people are like looking at me like, is he going to make us drink Kool-Aid or what? Like some of you might not be old enough to know what that means. But um, it's uh, for me, I'm super passionate about scuba diving because it changed my life. And I understand that not everybody's going to meet scuba where, where I'm at with it. But what I want to do is build out an increasing accessibility with scuba as the conduit, where at the end of the day, the structure that I'd like to build um, can increase accessibility for anything. It could be swimming, it could be triathlon, it could be playing the piano, it could be science, it could be anything where you can take scuba diving out and replace it with a different conduit. Um, and, it's, and it's a structure that increases accessibility to those people. Um, uh, to achieve their dreams. Marginalized people, historically marginalized people currently um, in, in different ways between race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, um, you know, veteran, non-veteran, you name it. I just want people to be able to have more opportunities to achieve their dreams. And that's what I'm doing through SCUBA. Um, and that's it for me. Uh, I, I talked about myself a lot, I'm really sorry. Um, but I, I just really wanted to kind of share a lot of context about what I do now. Um, one of the first topics we'd like to cover is navigating um, the industry, not just scuba industry, but the marine science world and academia really in general um, uh, as a person of color. And I wanted to kind of uh, turn it over to Michael to, to get his, uh, some of his initial thoughts and experiences on that. All righty, I'm back. <laughs> so um, yeah, one of the Things that I've noticed the most um, in this field, obviously, is uh, representation, and that's I haven't, fortunately, haven't had any like racist or um, anything super detrimental uh, happen to me personally. But it's just that when I when I'm in these spaces, um, whether it be in the environmental protection field or just diving, um, there's just a lack of of people that either look like me or people that are. Um, just uh, diversity in general. And I've always been the kind of person to, it never bothered me as much until I became educated about um, why this is happening. Um, because I'm one of those weird people that can, is comfortable being different or being in, a, um, in situations where I'm not like everyone else. And I was also a homosexual in the Navy. So um, I'm used to being in these environments where I stand out or I'm different. And I can be one of the people that has a little bit um, tougher skin when it comes to these uh, situations and can be more comfortable in it. But I try to put myself in uh, someone else's shoes that um, is new in their career or um, new to diving or something. And when you're new to situations, you kind of seek comfort and things that are familiar to you and when there's not representate, when there's not anyone that looks like you, you kind of feel like uh, maybe you have a little bit imposter syndrome, or uh, maybe there's some discomfort as well too. It's just added. It's just a little bit um, added pressure um, to some of the anxiety that's already that kind of come natural with you being in a new environment. And I'm hoping that someone like me, being in this field. Um, can at least just increase visibility and show other people that there are people like me that exist in this space um, and that you can do it too. And um, to just, I mean, to just go for it. You shouldn't, it's gonna be natural to be afraid 
um, like I said, if there's if if you're in environments where people don't look like you, but um, overcoming the fear and putting yourself in that situation not only benefits you, but it also benefits um, the people around you because if they're not exposed to it ever in their life and you're the first person, then you're already helping them in some kind of way. So um, yeah, I think represent representation is um, one of the biggest issues that should be addressed um, within these two fields. So the environmental protection field and uh, within the marine field. Want to add something to that? Yeah, so I mean, you, you hit on some really good points. Representation does matter because um, if if you see people who don't look like you in positions where you want to go, you really start to get the impression it's not possible for you. And, um, you know, and that's why trailblazers are important and um, increasing accessibility for those trailblazers to be able to move forward into new innovative ways um, in whatever field they choose, whether it's scuba or marine science or you know, aviation or whatever the case may be, you know, we, we need that representation. Um, what it's been like for me navigating things is um, I'm very clearly a, a what's considered a white passing person. I fully acknowledge that, fully acknowledge the privilege that that comes with. Um, and despite my name uh, on paper, I'm able to kind of like socially be able to navigate circles that, um, that people of color either can't or are not comfortable navigating. Um, and, um, what's been unique in my experience and what has been a challenge is, uh, not that it holds a candle to the plight of, of people of color by any means, but, um, uh, what's unique to my experience is that I've been, um, privy to what happens behind the curtain, uh, in a lot of instances, you know, everything from, uh, very hard, abrupt, uh, overt racism to, uh, more subtle, maybe even well-meaning, well-intentioned, um, racism through either colorblindness or, um, um, w w you know, savior complex of sorts, um, you know, where I'd, I'd shared with you before, like, you know, oh, like so-and-so didn't score as high on their test as the others, you know, uh, it might be just maybe the neighborhood he's from or, you know, something like that. And it's just all very coded, subtle language that create microaggressions. And what I had to learn early on is I, I found myself at a crossroads there. It's like, all right, especially depending on the circle I'm in, do I, do I say something or do I bite my tongue because I don't want to burn bridges and, and mess up, you know, the potential for opportunities for me in, in some of these, you know, pathways, some of these circles. Um, and I learned very quickly that uh, it doesn't pay to compromise my morals and values in any way. Um, knowing that I could leverage this privilege means I have a voice to be able to navigate those circles and, and, and tell those people what's problematic about what they're saying or what they're doing or what approach they're making with this situation that, that perpetuates marginalism. Um, and, um, and people are like, oh, aren't you concerned about your career? Like you have a wife and three children to take care of. And I said, look, like, uh, I guess the end, the ends justify the means because at the end of the day, I, I've been very outspoken about anything I've come across to uh, fellow scuba instructors, um, to fellow scientists, to uh, anybody else I've come across in the field that if they say something problematic, I'll meet them where they're at. And if I feel like it's well-intentioned and maybe just uh, comes from a place of ignorance or something like that, I'm not going to be like, hey, you're racist, you know, and you need to, you know, and, and kind of jump into that cancel culture, but just take the minute to try and educate them. Now, if it's like overt racism, like hard R racism, like, nah, nah, we're not doing this, like, have a nice day. And, and I'm not trying to be like a one man army, like having a, a Jerry Maguire moment, like, you know, you guys suck. I'm out of here. Who's coming with me? Um, that's another old reference. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> You know, but I, I just uh, I just wanted to make it like I want to be able to sleep at the end of the night knowing that I, I haven't compromised my morals. So it's, it's been unique navigating that space. And at the end of the day, I, I've had a wealth of opportunities, thanks to so many awesome people in my life through mentors and colleagues and friends that have opened up a lot of amazing opportunities for me to have the career I have now and to have such a, a bright future for myself um, while, while, while burning bridges with racists. <laughs> you know, that has not held me back, uh, thankfully. And, and maybe it's my privilege as a white passing person or, or, um, or not, I'm not entirely sure yet, but um, that's, that's been my experience kind of navigating these, these paths because uh, 
you know, structural racism is alive and well, individual racism is alive and well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've seen it, I've seen behind the curtain of it all and it's ugly and, um, and I've done well to, to steer clear of it. Thanks to my, my genuine outspokenness. <laughs> um, the next thing we wanted to do is, uh, about what can organizations, uh, can do. Um, I can go first a little bit. You can elaborate on a little bit if you want, Michael. Yeah, sure. Um, so when I say organizations, I don't mean like companies. I mean like 501c3s, other grassroots type organizations. Like um, I, I see one of the things I wanted to touch on was um, there's a lot of 501c3s out there that are focused on environmental conservation, environmental justice, and it's all it's all great, well-intentioned work. And what I see them doing is putting a lot of effort into on uh, into organizing, community organizing. Uh, online organizing, uh, re recruitment to try and build a whole army of sorts um, of ambassadors for their cause. And I think what could be a unique opportunity, so if you work with one of these organizations or you help run one or you have access to one, um, they're funded in part by mostly by grants uh, and a little bit by donations. So donations are easier because that's called unrestricted money, but these grants um, are, are dictated by, you know, the proposal for what the money is, is requested for. Uh, but these organizations, these foundations, these government grants, every so often put out needs assessments. And these organizations can say, um, you know, with some help from, from DIA Scuba Council, from some help from me, to be able to pull statistics and write verbiage to say, we would like to sponsor a, a youth scuba program, you know, especially for, you know, a youth scuba, scuba program, that reflects the diversity of our community right here in our backyard, wherever we're based in Miami, Florida, or, you know, Monterey, California, or Hilo, Hawaii. We want, you know, an organization, we want a program that builds on the, on the rich diversity of our community in a, in a genuine and authentic way, not to, not to tokenize these youth of color, but to bring them in respectfully on their terms to train them in scuba because if we turn them into scuba divers we have a much like a uh, higher likeliness that we're going to be able to develop our own army uh and and uh, of ambassadors through our cause um through scuba training and and continued scientific programming um that makes a lot of sense that's, that's where we can really start with um with um building out some of these things that organizations can do um, in providing accessibility to scuba. Uh, it's a little unprecedented because there's not a whole lot of grants out there that specifically call for, we'd like to fund youth scuba programs. They just don't exist. We're gonna have to start demanding it as a community, um, demanding it in a, in a way that helps create that accessibility uh, for youth of color um, and for other marginalized youth. And so, you know, um, those, are, those are some of the things uh, that um, that I have some experience in, in being able to um, write those needs assessments uh, and look at budget proposals on what uh, a sustainable youth scuba program could look like uh, in the backyards of a lot of these uh, environmental conservation groups, because they, they really go hand in hand. Um, Michael, did you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. Uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit at the beginning. Um, yeah, a lot of especially environmental organiz organizations, um, whether they be international or domestic, mm -hmm. um, they can get a little caught up in their causes. And it's easy to dismiss the people um, in these areas locally and say that they don't care about the, the environment or they don't care about um, protecting uh, sea turtles or, or whale sharks and all these kind of things. Um, without taking into consideration um, the priorities that they have. Um, so some of these people, it's not that they don't care, it's that um, their priority isn't to go to the ocean or to um, care about plastic. It's to feed their families, it's to go to work, it's to, um, it's to balance work, uh, uh, work and um, life as well. So, um, and I think that's another reason why uh, representation is important because then you'll have someone there that understands this um, and can at least diffuse the situation and, 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 and explain that their priorities just aren't really in these environmental causes or um, and it's and 
just dispel the myth that these people don't care or um, they're not interested in well too. And I, and I, and I think that um, increasing, um, trying to help the awareness and interest in these people is also something else that organizations can do by having a hand um, in that in some kind of way. Yeah, I, um, I'm glad you touched on it. Like this isn't just unique to America. Obviously racism exists, you know, on some level, uh, even in the form of like colorism, you know, in, in almost every culture um, that has been touched by imperial colonialism uh, throughout history. And so, you know, um, I, had, I had shared with you earlier, like this, this can truly be an international effort uh, to increase accessibility to scuba. Um, it, and I want to put words to it because we're all kind of like working under the assumption that we know this is true. Um, but scuba is an inherently cost prohibitive activity. It's, it's, a, it's a status symbol for those who can afford it. And so it's not just unique to people of color, um, but, it, but uh, to all, all people um, of a certain socioeconomic status that, um, that have difficulty accessing something like scuba. It's, it's considered a luxury um, because of how expensive it is, it is. And that's why I'm looking for grant money and to build out the nonprofit side of the scuba community to provide more accessibility, um, to provide an opportunity to build a whole new generation of science-minded people. They don't have to work in science, but they, when you're scuba certified, you've gone through physics and physiology training, like, you know, there's, there, and especially as a youth, you have this opportunity to um, plant a seed in, in these minds of the youth that, that science is important because they're learning about an activity where science is literally keeping them alive. Science and, and engineering, right? And the, the, the uh, um, uh, ingenuity of, uh, of the both uh, put together. And, um, and that kind of helps kind of mold that mind to, to have that science-minded background moving forward. Um, more specifically in scuba as an industry, you know, people go on vacation to like Bali or to Puerto Rico or to the Philippines. And um, the dive shops there are, um, a lot of them are run by white American expats, you know? And, you know, for me personally, I'm like, man, I'm looking around going, I would love to be able to help put a program together. Not that I want to be a, a savior of sorts, but like, you know, in a, in a way that makes sense for the culture and the, and the community of these, of these places around the world to get locals scuba certified, maybe even instructor certified and start leveraging their own natural historic beauty of their ancestral lands uh, as a means of income for ecotourism, for scientific diving and training uh, for people to go do um, versus, you know, Americans who um, who leveraged, you know, a, a, a considerable amount of privilege to retire in, you know, in, uh, you know, the Galapagos and, and run a dive shop there um, with no contextual history, uh, uh, culturally, um, spiritually, or environmentally. And so, um, you know, those, the, 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 this whole concept can be bigger than just America, absolutely. Yep. And uh, um, just to add another thing, it's one of the reasons I fell in love with the Reef Check organization. Like they're worldwide. They they get everyone involved on so many levels, um, whether it be race or different countries and everything. Um, and, and I like this because it counteracts the idea that climatism, climate activism and um, ocean causes or and things like that are only associated with elitism and with with white people and it's like when re in reality like this is everyone's planet and everyone should care about it and it's not a race thing it's not a country thing like everyone should be a part of this in some kind of way and i i love the fact that um reef check gives other countries this opportunity to do stuff like that with science of all things <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely um i'm glad you mentioned reef check like reef check if i had to you know, uh, pick one organization that's really doing it right. It's it's Reef Check, and and by by example, real fast before we move on to the next topic, um, there was a point where Tristan McHugh, um, who's amazing, I can't say enough about her, uh, had reached out to me uh, and let me know that she has in the works. And forgive me if I wasn't supposed to share this, but um, I, I I know COVID is holding it up anyway, so I'm not sure the status, but it's at least proposed 
that um, uh, for some grant money to partner reef check with local indigenous tribes in California, starting with Northern California um, with Sherwood Valley Band of Pomo um, to get some of their land stewards. Um, and this is a whole ecological environmental approach uh, led through indigenous sovereignty and stewardship um, to, to work with coastal tribes um, to get them trained in scuba, which I would provide, and then uh, and then serve as a funnel into reef check scientific diving protocol, um, so that they can leverage those skills um, to be able to um, collect data uh, regionally uh, in a way that's culturally competent and genuine and authentic that aligns with their cultural values of how they have uh, provided stewardship to those coastlines uh, for thousands of years before um, colonialism came along. And, um, and to be able to make well-informed decisions uh, about uh, that stewardship. And so um, I thought that was an amazing idea because one, it, it recognizes indigenous sovereignty and stewardship, which I'm obviously a, a strong proponent of. And two, it was designed to meet them where they're at knowing that they needed a grant to get scuba certified because at its core, Reef Check takes already certified divers and, and turns them into citizen scientists, right? Um, but to, but to see a disparity and say, all right, if we're going to do this, this is where we need to be. And this is what we need to account for and address. And to bring someone like me in who can teach scuba with that cultural competency to indigenous tribes in California. I was just like, man, I, I'm in love with Reef Check. I'm in love with everything that they want to do. And I'm, you know, and we're going to continue partnering with them through USX. I'm going to continue my training with, with, you, with Reef Check to be an instructor, instructor trainer, and really help build out that program because they're, they're doing amazing things. And I, I owe a lot of my resume to Reef Check in why I was even on USX's radar to be considered to launch their ocean research program thanks to the experience that I got as a citizen scientist. Um, and we'll, we'll elaborate more on that a little bit. Um, we have here what employers can do, what companies can do. We're looking at companies that do uh, ocean research in different ways, you know, less on the 501c3 side, more on the on the company side of things. And you had some thoughts about that, Michael? Um, you can go ahead first. I, I'm trying to find my... <laughs> well, one thing we'd like to do is when it comes to, because this is called shaping a career path. So we wanted to talk about what our unconventional career paths look like and some of the, the barriers and challenges that we face, oh, yeah. uh, especially because we, we have... Uh, fairly unorthodox uh, backgrounds, you know, without a traditional science background, especially since I became the executive director of a nonprofit um, without a science degree. It, it was almost all on my strategic planning and, and operations and logistics background. And, um, and I, I wanted to say this real fast, what, what was great about that experience, but, but also a very unique one that doesn't apply to a lot of people is that when I was on that phone conversation with Harold Earls and Connor Love, uh, they were both active duty army at the time who created USX as this passion project on the side from their active duty status to, to get military veterans connected with STEM field research in austere environments. I was able to, I, I didn't even really have a resume. I was just able to tell them I worked as an intelligence operator with seven special forces group. And for them, that's all they needed to hear because they were in a unique position themselves to know what skill sets I have um, that have absolutely been developed in me for me to be able to survive in that kind of environment. Um, There's kind of strategic planning that I have, the attention to detail that it takes to be able to map out Intel on a map and, and plan operations down to the second, including equipment, personnel, skill sets, um, you know, environmental factors, you know, terrain, you name it, like so many layered factors into a mission, into an operation that I helped run uh, in seventh group that they were, that, that all that was unspoken. That, that's my point. All of that, all of those skill sets were unspoken because I was speaking to someone who understood my, my experience, right? And that translates to when you're working with someone uh, who you want to emulate and you're talking to them and they have an opportunity to open a career path for you, you can share just a little bit of your experience. And if it's someone like you who has walked the path similar to you that, that you have, just a, a, maybe a, a few steps further along, 
there's that relatability where they understand like, yes, like you are a valuable asset and they can see your value a lot easier. Um, and that's, that makes people of color and marginalized people uh, a lot, uh, feel a lot safer navigating these spaces. Um, and so how do we do that, right? How do we, how do we get marginalized people in positions of power where they can help open up doors and opportunities for others uh, to make all of these spaces more equitable? Um, one thing I wanted to touch on was um, a reevaluation of your job descriptions. Um, a lot of times, um, and, and, and again, I've, I've peeked behind the curtain and um, uh, HR uh, um, sections of companies, when they put out a job description, especially for like marine science or environmental science things, you know, there's, there's a few unique factors that might be um, inherent to their organization, but most of the time, uh, job postings are, are a copy and paste job. And, and there's not a, a strong look at those positions uh, and, and, and what really makes sense and what, what isn't. For instance, one of my job, first jobs I applied for in the Bay required me to have a driver's license and my own car. And I'm like, this is a position for the director of communications. Why do I need my own car? And this is in Oakland too. Like there's BART, like we can take public transit everywhere. Why do I need my own car? And they're like, oh, because we have multiple sites that you're going to need to be able to easily navigate to. And I'm like, well, that's for me to figure out then. And I, and I will I definitely won't let it hinder my ability to do my job. But at the end of the day, I have PTSD related to a, a vehicle convoy uh, attack. And I, I don't feel comfortable driving most of the time. Um, there's, there's, you know, anxiety and, and other mental health triggers around that. And I, and I don't want to do that, you know, but if I, if I wasn't as outspoken and vocal about that, I could have looked at that and said, ah, I don't qualify because I don't have a driver's license, right? You know, and, and that's just and that's just one little thing that, that can apply to so many different people. Uh, and, and, and it's it's inherently a barrier to people of a certain socioeconomic status that that can't afford a vehicle uh, and rely on public transit to, to get around everywhere. You know, to be like, ah, I need a driver's license, I don't qualify. And then they, they get discouraged from applying altogether. Um, so to take a hard, long look about what those requirements are, what those re re requisites are. I know, Michael, you, you I, I know you had some about like- I remember my know, point now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about, um, about the certain like uh, credentials and qualifications, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. So um, I think it would be cool to see, to have um, employers train their HR departments or their, their headhunters to look for these specific um, environmental fellowships, um, scholarships, um, these, these opportunities that arise, especially while they're in college, um, that sort of provide the credentials that they need for the type of job that they're looking for, um, while also destigmatizing the idea uh, where, where they have that, the, 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 two, um, the two potential employees mm -hmm. and they're weighing it um, by just because one is a person of color and uh, but not qualifications and you hear people say that constantly like like oh because of I th well affirmative action is gone now but <laughs> um, because of policies in place like that a workplace will hire um, a black person just because they an, an un underqualified black person just because they need diversity and I think to avoid things like that if you train your HR departments to look for things like um, the environmental fellowship that, um, what is it? The University of Michigan just created for people of color in the environmental field. I think if they're, they become more aware of things like that, then they'll have more qualified um, people of color to compete with um, uh, the, the counterpart. And I think that that would be really cool to, um, for them to, for the HR department to know as well. And also if, if other people of color are seeing that companies are invested in things like this and they have their hands involved in um, positive scenarios like this, I think that that would also attract um, qualified people as well too. So um, I think it just comes back full circle. Like everyone gets involved in some kind of way. Um, or everyone, there's a more positive outcome from everyone um, if employers got involved uh, in this aspect. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I feel like 
um, the, the real work that needs to be done in that area, especially in terms of like sustainable income and, and careers um, for marginalized people, um, utilizing scuba in different ways, um, especially through like marine science and, and uh, ocean sciences, is that um, we need programs that build out a larger pool of well-qualified people to choose from. Um, you know, and that starts with getting youth certified in scuba that, that, um, that trickles into having stronger marine bio programs in high schools. Um, I, I didn't share my marine bio experience in, 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 uh, in high school, but, um, but maybe in a little bit in the Q and A, if somebody wants to ask about that. Um, oh, yeah. Probably but like, but like scho scholarships and fellowships, you know, um, I just got emailed one from a C smart organization, um, uh, that are looking for middle school and high school aged women of color, um, uh, to apply to their scholarship, to be able to go to a summer program in Honduras, um, to get scuba certified and learn more about, um, uh, scientific diving. And I was like, man, like this, like we need a one-stop shop to like promote this information. That's what I want DIA Scuba Council to be, to, to really be that, that uh, echo chamber and that conduit to, to get this information out there. And we're gonna be doing a lot more with that soon through the Facebook group um, and through social media and uh, an email list. Now that we have a, a, a budding email list of the registrants uh, for this call, um, for anybody who wants to be involved in Scuba Council to kind of like, help be um, uh, an amplifier uh, of these opportunities, these unique opportunities to not only promote the ones that exist, but to, um, but to help create even more. And so um, that brings me to my next point, unless Michael had anything else. Um, I think we have 11 minutes left, so we should probably do Q&A. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think we can do two hours. Um, oh. Oh, I thought it was an hour and a half. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we'll just we'll just go until the wheels fall off, man. <laughs> um, is what you can do. That's that's a big part of like you know what individuals like we talked about like you know employers and uh, organizations and whatnot. But like how how can people get involved? And I wanted to kick that off with starting with you. You heard a lot about Michael's story and and my story and. I and I want to I want to say this bluntly. If if you try to mimic what we have done. Um, you're probably going to fail because it's you're not us. We we were fortunate to be able to leverage our lived experience in a way that that conveyed the value of of these lived experiences, no matter how unconventional or unorthodox they they were, to be able to bring to the table to say yes, I can do this, and for those opportunities to open up for us. And so, with that said, I want to I want to kick this off with these these are just resources for you to mull over and see if they work for you. But at the end of the day, if you want a career path, um, and, and especially like if you're already scuba certified and you just want to figure out something different and unique to do with that as a career, outside of being an instructor or work at a dive shop or work for a dive manufacturing company, all the more conventional scuba related jobs. Uh, if you want to be a scientist, if you want to be a commercial diver, there's so many opportunities. Build out a plan that works for you, that is unique, so unique to you that only you can fill it to be able to step into it where nobody can deny it, nobody can take it away from you because it's built specifically to you where all of your lived experience culminates into a position where it can never be taken away from you. Um, that's what I have done and continue to do. And that's definitely what Michael is, is doing. And so that's, that's really the best advice uh, I can give you to preface some of these resources we'd like to share with you. Um, with that said, uh, I'd like to turn it over to, to Michael to talk about Reef Check. <laughs> Haven't I talked about them enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, uh, we've, we've sang Reef Check's praises, man. Like it, it's, it's a great organization and um, it is. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, no, I, yeah, like I said, I can't brag enough about them. They definitely helped me launch my career. Um, I've made some very meaningful connections. Um, that one guy I go... I used to go kayaking with every Monday until I got a job. <laughs> we go kayak diving and um, he's just an awesome person. He's been with Reef Check since the organization started and he has nothing but positive things to say about the, the organization too. And I mean, it's very obvious that it attracted someone like me and I'm a big fan and, and just what it's been able to do for me professionally, um, 
personally as well too. Um, I've definitely overcome um, some fears underwater. Uh, some I've been able to become a better diver through them and increasing my knowledge about my environment. I think it's such a cool thing that I can just hop in the water and be like, oh, there's a blue rockfish. Oh, there's a China rockfish and just know how to identify these things. Mm -hmm. And and when there's something special about that too, because it, it makes you just care about your surroundings even more. And um, Reef Check definitely helped um, channel all of my positive energy um, into just ocean causes, um, just into in the environmental protection field, um, also helping me sharpen my skills as well too um, as a scientific diver. And I think it's just a great place for someone like me to um, sort of break into the environmental field, if anything. Um, like Anesti said, it might be kind of hard to, <laughs> to um, copy our routes and everything, but if you're really serious about um, a, an environment, being in an environmental field, I think that being a diver with Reef Check just makes you stand out because because anyone in the environmental field can have, um, you know, the environmental science background just like everyone else. But if you're a diver and that's what you're doing out there, I think that that makes you just stand out a lot, a lot more. It makes you um, have something to talk about um, during the interview process. And it really just shows that you're able to combine your passion with your um, your passion for diving and um, uh, a recreational like hobby with uh, a cause that you care about. So um, yeah, <laughs> there's my spew about Reef Check. <laughs> yeah, I, um, Reef Check single-handedly helped me like um, have a, a, a really strong understanding of the biodiversity of California when I first moved there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even when I started to work as a, as a dive master and dive master candidate, um, I'm taking people, you know, certified divers coming through on, on tours. Uh, and I'm like, oh, look, there's some kelp. Oh, look, there's a fish. There's a crab. And then after reef check, I'm like, hey, there's a blue rockfish. You know, there's a, there's a king crab over there. Oh, look, metridiums. You know, and like I know the names of these things now, thanks to yeah, reef check. Exactly. Um, and this was long before I started any sort of scientific, you know, career. Uh, career. Um, uh, but it also helps set me apart now that I've made the decision unique to me to go back to school and bring my scientific credentials full circle with my my operations and, and the business side of, of science uh, and ocean expeditions, if, if, if you will, um, where I'm in school and I'm, I'm in I'm in biology now and marine bio and they're like, all right, ladies and gentlemen, this is and it's a it's a, you know, a sample in a jar, right? Of like, this is a unique type of anemone called a metridium. I'm like, Oh yeah, I've seen those before. They're like, oh where? Like, oh, I, I used to take my students out to the Metridium fields past the pipeline at Breakwater Monterey all the time, you know. And they're like, I was like, yeah, here's some pictures, and I posted them big pictures, and they're just like, okay then, like you know. And it, it makes the learning process a, a little easier where I'm not being introduced to a lot of this for the very first time. I've been, I've, I have my lived experience. Not that I want to step in and be like, oh, I know all this, but it, it provides an extra comfort so that I am, I'm not overwhelmed by what is being taught to me because I'm still still very studious, still paying attention to everything that is being taught, but at least I can meet it where I'm at with a certain level of experience through Reef Check and other organizations that I've worked with over time now to be like, I have some experience that helps me a little more comfortable with this material. And mm -hmm. that's all. Um, and, and that has been proven super helpful uh, in navigating uh, academia right now uh, versus seeing it all for the first time. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a way better, to me personally, um, the sensory experience just makes it a way of an even better uh, learning environment. Like you can only learn, to me, you can only learn so much in a classroom and just sit there and stare at a book and memorize everything and then just data dump it. Or a jar. Vice, vice <laughs> hopping in the water and, um, well, you shouldn't be touching them, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, possibly, yeah. <laughs> possibly touching them, um, feeling the water, um, understanding why the ocean is moving the way it's moving um, while you're down there. Um, uh, touching the macroalgae, you know, things like these, just, it's just way more sensory experience, um, way more of a sensory experience that makes you, that helps me internalize and, and, and memorize like these species, these, um, these plants that I'm working with and, and everything. And I think that that's really cool. 
Yeah, and it also bridges the gap between species identification to the challenges that we're facing. So through through my citizen yeah. science work, I've been able to learn about coral reef bleaching and, and what that is and around climate change and ocean acidification and um, you know, and uh, urchin the, barrens. I feel like yeah, the the purple urchin barrens with kelp forests and and uh, and um, when I first started volunteering at Aquarium of the Bay is when I was first introduced to um, sea star wasting disease that that started mm -hmm. to become a thing. You know, started up north and moved downward, um, and so you start to understand you know and have firsthand knowledge and experience of of not just what these challenges are, but what they look like and the impact they're having on these environments for you to take that forward uh, in your yeah. career as well. And the importance of certain species and if one is removed, why it causes a chain reaction and an overabundance of another one or an underabundance. It's it's so fascinating to just learn all of these, these incredible things about science, just underwater, like in the field and environments like that really, really work for me. <laughs> Yeah. So obviously we can't cover all the different organizations, but the, but, you know, reef check is just one example that both uh, Michael and I are very familiar with and have navigated and, and seen praises about. Um, but there are a number of others. Um, you know, there's a, a quite a few that are unique to veterans. Obviously, USX, uh, the organization I run is one of them. Um, somebody had mentioned in the chat uh, Force Blue. I am familiar with them. I think they're a great organization. They really help uh, do really good work with the Coral Reef Restoration Foundation out of Florida. I'm familiar with those guys. It's all a pretty tight knit circle, especially in like former Spec Ops Command uh, guys. And um, I had touch base with them at DEMA 2017 or 2018. In the, in the last three to four years, I had worked with them, uh, not worked with them, but met with them uh, at DEMA. Uh, which is a big scuba convention that happens annually and um and it was appealing uh but what 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 kind of set things different for me and and what's cool about them and and they can keep going with what they're doing is that uh it's unique to former special forces uh former mm -hmm. special ops soldiers uh which i qualify for um but i i um i was hoping to be part of something that was a little more inclusive um, of the veteran community, because not all of us are, are special yeah. forces, you know. Because um, another thing is, is that um, especially as it stood at the time, I know some changes are being made uh, even as we speak, but um, that automatically limits their programming to male veterans because only man, men were allowed to be um, special ops. And oh, yeah. so um, they had they had women who were like running logistics or operations, but like actual participants in their programming were unique to men specifically because they were limited to um, spec, former special ops soldiers. And so um, it was it was around the same time where I connected with USX. And so I literally had like these two organizations, Force Blue and USX on my plate to choose from. Um, and obviously I chose USX and it's really worked out really well for me, for me to be executive director now. I highly doubt I'd be the executive director of Force Blue if I, if I went that route. Um, but but it's, it's an organization that um, that is open to all veterans, um, regardless of your discharge status, regardless of your your military experience. We will, we're looking for veterans that have specialized skill sets in survival skills uh, in certain areas that can that have lived experience in, you know, Mount, you know, places like Mount Everest and Denali or the Juno ice fields to be able to go out there and help PIs. Um, principal investigators of, of laboratories collect data in these remote environments um, and, um, and, and scuba divers that have experience, um, in, you know, or want experience through training to be able to come in and get training and reef check uh, and other scientific, yeah, AUS scientific diving protocols to, to help us collect data under the water uh, as well. So um, long story short, reach out, look out for your, you know, your backyard about what organizations exist. Um, to um that, that may offer subsidized scuba training um that's always an option there's only a handful of organizations that i know of so far obviously we're working really hard to to build that out a lot more um and maybe there's a lot more that just aren't on my radar and and i i accept responsibility for that but mm -hmm. as it stands now less than five percent of scuba is is nonprofit. so um you know you're, you're gonna have to you know it's 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 um you're gonna have to dig really hard really deep um, I paid for my scuba classes out of my own pocket uh, with my tax return because, you know, that's what you do with tax returns, right? It's either scuba lessons or, or 20 inch, you know, platinum rims, right? Um, <laughs> and so, 
Um, for me, it was uh, uh, two months in um, China to study Kung Fu or Madagascar to do marine conservation. <laughs> I went yeah. with marine conservation. Excellent choices. <laughs> Uh, you, couldn't have, you, you couldn't have gone wrong either way, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you chose Madagascar and, and, you know, and, uh, and we're here today talking about what we're talking about. So mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, at this time, I, you know, if there's any other questions about like what you can do to get more involved, you know, definitely let's open up to Q and A. Um, I'd like to start first with some questions, um, with, um, uh, in the chat, I know I had touched on uh, the force blue one already. Um, let me see here. Um, oh, a lot of people connecting central Valley. Oh, I lived in Visalia for a year. What's up? Um, I, I, my, my wife is from there. And so we, we lived there as a transition from the Bay, then the expensive nature of the Bay before moving to Florida. So we, we moved down to central Valley, um, um, uh, Exeter Visalia area. So big shout out to the central Valley. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, what were you describing when you found scuba diving makes me think of Blue Mind. Are you familiar with the book? Uh, I am not. Uh, I think maybe Thaddeus had mentioned that in a, a webinar a while back, um, but I've, I've got to look it up. I'm not familiar, but um, thank you again for that note. In fact, I'm going to put it in my phone now. Blue Mind. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar, um, but... I would love to learn more about that. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of praise. This is really awesome. Uh, burning yeah. bridges with yeah. racists, love it. Yeah, that's what's up. Um, yeah, Force Blue. Let's see here. Uh, how young students can get into scuba diving and what careers uh, they should be choosing. Um, that's a great question. So. Um, well, the first part is how they can get involved in scuba diving. Um, as it stands right now, the, the most conventional path is to Google your city or Google uh, scuba near me or scuba in Fresno or scuba in Miami or whatever the case, you know, wherever you live. Um, and uh, dive shops, um, local dive shops, uh, they're an important part of the scuba community. Um, they're 99%, they're if not 100%, like locally run and owned. Uh, independently from any major corporations. So you're supporting like local economy in that way. And they offer scuba lessons. Um, they, you know, and, and, and so many well-intentioned people uh, that run these scuba shops, they, they have to charge an amount that is sustainable for them. And that's all understandable. I'm not saying like, oh, scuba shops need to lower their prices because scuba is expensive. They have to charge what they have to charge for scuba to be sustainable and, and the equipment uh, and the cost of the equipment as well and the maintenance of all that equipment um you know but but you know because it's an equipment heavy activity it is expensive so that's why i'm looking for grants that can mutually benefit the for-profit side of scuba um to be able to um ensure that the local dive shop gets paid what they're worth for their time and their energy and and the equipment that the person is is purchasing um that can subsidize or, or provide at cost um scuba training for that individual who is also not taking away a student from that shop um, because not only there's, the shop is still going to get paid, um, but it creates a new diver in the community and, and, a, and a rising tide, you know, raises all ships, right? And so more scuba divers in the community mean better all around, you know, economic status for these local dive shops. Um, what they should be, careers they should be choosing, it's, it's up to them. I, I, I I want, like I had mentioned before, I want our youth to be science minded. Um, if that means they become a scientist or a lawyer or a politician, especially, um, I would want them to be science minded. I want them to have a, a true intrinsic understanding of science as, as valid, um, as a valid approach to understanding the world around us. That's it. I don't care if they want to be the I next, uh, next, the next rock star, you know, on, on the voice, you know, or something like, you know, it doesn't matter what their career path is. I want them to be science minded uh, is the goal. Um, we need more scientists too. We need more people who can go out and collect data and, and, and we need more science communicators that can not only understand the science, but be able to amalgamate it 
and present it in a way uh, for public education that helps um, encourage and, and, and motivate people to take action if something is amiss. And obviously something is very amiss with climate change right now that we are not taking action on um, because of inept leadership. Um, hopefully that's changing moving forward now, we'll see. Um, I'm, I'm a bit more of a radical than a centrist, so I'm not holding my breath, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially when it comes to the environment. But, you know, um, we, we need more people, you know, and it can start with our youth. Um, but it needs to be adults because we need we, we can't we need to plant seeds for our youth to have these understandings as they move forward. And also we need more immediate action with adults to, to, to be more well informed and take action uh, much sooner than later as well. Anything you wanted to add to that, Michael? Um, I think you you mentioned it um, earlier, and just yeah, increasing just even just the interest um, in some kind of way, because there's a lot of um, marginalized communities that, uh, for example, a speaker came to my school um, this past uh, fall. I want to say, and she is the creator of an um, of an NGO that helps um, get Latinos, uh, Latinx community involved with uh, more ocean centric causes and just being involved with the ocean in general. Um, and she gave us a shocking statistic that of a large percentage of um, Latinx community that live in uh, Los Angeles, for example, have never been to the beach and they only live like 15 minutes from it. And what her organization does is she helps provide um, either transportation or beach cleanups, seminars and conferences for these people to attend um, just so that they can just become more aware of it and just know that it's there and to be more comfortable with it and things like that. And I, 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 like, I like this message and this idea because, and like you said earlier, Anessi, an interest needs to be planted in the children's minds at some point so that um, they know that, you know, the ocean's out there and it's not that scary and it can be as enjoyable as everyone else enjoys it. And um, yeah, to just generate more interest in the, in the youth. Um. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, which kind of brings me to my next question. I'd like to pass over to you. Um, is marine biology and scuba diving for any age? How do you feel about that? Hmm. For any age? Well, do they mean like as far as a career or just to know? Because I feel like, yeah, it's for any age, but- Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so scuba diving, there are age limitations. So there are, there are programs as young as eight years old through PADI called SEAL Team. Um, my son went through it. He became a SEAL Team and a Master SEAL. Um, and it's, uh, it's specific to pool training only uh, until they're 10 years old. And most organizations across the board, most of the more well-known reputable organizations, uh, PADI, NAWI, SSI, SDI, um, they allow scuba training, open water scuba training um, as young as 10 years old. So that's, you know, that's a big deal. Um, you know, and then in some cases like my son, you know, they can start as young as eight through, um, through pool training. Um, so by the time my son was, was 10, before he even got open water certified, he had pool training in a lot of specialties um, that you can do in, in scuba. Uh, between like wreck diving, um, uh, simulated obviously because it's in a pool, um, but but you know the the concepts of wreck diving, uh, search and recovery, navigation, underwater photography. There's so many different avenues uh, um, and concepts within scuba diving uh, that that each one of those could be a unique career path um, for for a lot of people. And so um, you know get them involved young. Um, a lot of aquariums offer programs too for the youth to. Um to start the scuba diving programs and yeah. just like to generate an interest as well too so um yeah want I, I wanted to check with your local like aquarium see if they have programs like that that exist they're really cool yeah and um it came to mind one organization when i had mentioned like wreck diving and search and recovery uh i had mentioned it briefly earlier uh diving with a purpose uh it's an excellent organization um that uh, gets young divers, mostly black divers, involved in marine archaeology because uh, they get them trained in scuba, trained in 
um, uh, underwater archaeology concepts, and they go out as an organization and uh, find and document uh, slave ships in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. Um, and so you you have that uh, high level of cultural competency that's built out from the inside um, that just makes sense all around for people to be able to create accessibility to scuba, but but with a strong sense of culture and purpose that is unique um, to to those. To, the, to their lived experience, to be able to, um, uh, and historical uh, and ancestral experience, to be able to go out there and and reconnect in that way. And it's, it's very beautiful. And, um, you know, that's, that's uh, another program out of uh, Florida, if, not, if I'm not mistaken, but you can Google it, Diving with a Purpose. Um, they do some, uh, uh, some great work. Um, we, um, I, I did want to kick it over to Thaddeus real fast. He wanted to share an image of something and, and had a question as well. Go ahead, Thaddeus, if you're still here. Yeah, you have the image that you, you can share it or? Uh, no, I, I don't. I thought you could just share your screen you. if you can. There you go. So I, I just want to comment that um, I've run across, including myself, and I, I appreciate you and Michael sharing about your, your you know, the challenges and struggles and your successes and your uniqueness and how you got your journey to where you are today. But when you're talking about PTSD mm -hmm. and you're talking about increasing the participation of black indigenous and people of color in, in scuba diving and, and uh, marine uh, ecology and science, what I ran across as an interest, but also the fear, especially when putting on the uh, scuba equipment, when you put on the, the uh, BCD in the tank, that caused me uh, uh, some panic attacks, actually. Mm -hmm. And it was going through this process of underwater meditation that allowed me to go to open water and do advanced dives and, and do night dives, because otherwise I don't know if I could have. So uh, we, and th this was not, I didn't do it knowingly. It was coincidental. I was working with a Chi Gung instructor and the mm -hmm. Chi Gung instructor was a, a scuba diver. And mm -hmm. that's how this started, going underwater to do Qigong mm. to do, or, and Tai Chi. So it didn't start with like, I need to do this in order to be successful, but I was struggling and I would tough it out and, I, and, and, and go, go uh, do 30 feet. But I, was, I, was, uh, I had my moments there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now I'm comfortable at, uh, you know, and, and I, ha I haven't dove in a bit though, but so now that you're in Florida, we got to we got to do something, um, and that's it. I just wanted to say that because I'm really, really uh, um, uh, keen on and actually have certification in helping reduce stress and anxiety through mindfulness methods for mm -hmm. people with PTSD and and uh, other um, anxiety issues. Yeah. I yeah. Um, go ahead, Michael. You brought up a good point. I didn't know, just given my background, I uh, I was raised by the black side of my family up until uh, about middle school. And then from middle school up until I went to the, the military, I was raised by my grandmother, my Filipino grandmother who was married to a white man. And she, we lived in his home in a predominantly white suburban neighborhood. So the school that I went to was predominantly white. So we had access to pools. Um, I was on the swim team and um, I swam a lot. I was comfortable in the water. And then when I joined the military, I didn't even know that black people feared water or had a, or, or weren't even comfortable in like the deep end of the pool or just even in a pool in general until I was, until I had to jump off of a 20 foot high um, like board into the deep end of the pool. And then you had to swim 50 meters to the is either 50 or 100 to the other end and I'm just swimming like comfortably like like it's no problem and then I hear just these grown men just shouting and screaming and crying at the top of it because they can't jump into the water and what they would do and and, and they were all black men and what they would do was they would bring them over to the kiddie pool and try to do these exercises where they would just get comfortable with trying to, to lean them back into the water. And, and they couldn't even do that. They would be there for like 20, 30 minutes because they and immediately just thought that they were either gonna drown or die or they just weren't comfortable with it in any kind of way. And that was the first time I ever saw anything like that. And 
it wasn't until probably like two or three years ago that I learned of, you know, just the systemic racism and the 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 deep horrible roots um, as to why so many Black people aren't comfortable with water just in general. And and there's a there's been some studies that it's related to the slave trade coming across the Atlantic. There's been um, there's also um, just urban areas, the inner city areas, when um, segregation existed, blacks couldn't swim in, in pools, so they didn't have access. So then when they tried to swim in pools, um, because they never had access, they didn't, they weren't taught properly how to swim, um, there were high fatality rates. So then within the, the, the inner city communities, there were stereotypes started being perpetuated that black people can't swim, um, and largely it was from either fear or, um, and, and the fatalities that were happening. Um, and then even within the community, within the black community, um, we tell each other that things like this are for white people. Like that's not, that's white people shit. Black people don't do that, stay away from that. You know, so, it, and that has just perpetuated into the culture that we have now. And there's, there's still that fear in black people um, of water and it just has such terrible, terrible roots. And like I said, I wasn't exposed to it until I was um, an adult and I'm a black man. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not right and it's not wrong that, you know, some white people aren't aware of that or, or that um, other black communities aren't aware of that either. But it's just, it's, it's, it's all about education now and then how we can change that. And I really think that that's cool that you are involved in something like this and overcoming that fear that you mentioned earlier of, of just breathing underwater. Um, I, I think that that's really, really cool. And that's another reason why I um, wanted to get involved in this space because like I said, um, I wanted to increase visibility in this space and just show people that we can do this. Like, <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. Ah, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this event and uh, and sharing all that you are and all that you do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, appreciate that. Um, we had uh, a few more questions real fast. Um, um, oh, I want to give a quick shout out too to my friend Jules Jackson down in San Diego. Um, she has a program called Coastal Defenders. Uh, it's one of the few organizations that I'm familiar with, especially that's indigenous led. Uh, in fact, the only organization that's indigenous led that um, that is working around getting youth more involved in coastal ecology and ocean sciences and, um, you know, really looking for ways to be able to um, increase accessibility and hopefully introduce a scuba component uh, into that as well, because that that's practical hands on experience. That is the, the hook. You know, um, you know, people, youth can be fascinated by sharks, they can be fascinated by, you know, all kinds of cool things, but like scuba diving as an activity introduces them hands on to all of that. And, uh, and that's uh, a game changer, you know, in, in a lot of ways. And um, whether you came across it accidentally, like I did thinking diving with sharks was going to be my next big adventure or like Thaddeus getting involved in the martial arts doing Qigong and, um, and Tai Chi underwater as, as a form of therapy. Um, you know, or if you have a very specific intention to be like, I'm going to be a scuba diver and this is how I'm going to leverage it. You know, um, the, the effect is all the same. We're, we're growing the community um, of science-minded people who can get out and, and have that adventurous, explorative uh, mindset to be able to, to, you know, fall in love with the ocean, you know, um, with our own eyes and, and serve as very unique uh, ambassadors to the rest of the world um, about the impacts uh, with the ocean. And, uh, you know, whether we, whether we follow that as a career or not, you know, it's, it's still an experience that we can take with us everywhere we go as ocean ambassadors. Um, uh, I know Steph mm -hmm. Lex had mentioned that youth can get involved with her program there if you guys want to connect with her in the chat um, as well. Um, uh, is there any other um, live questions? If, you, if you, we didn't answer your question in the chat, you know, feel free to just um, um, raise your hand and, um, We'll, uh, we'll pick somebody uh, if we want to answer a few live questions. I did want to get off a, a hard stop at eight o'clock because there is another webinar um, coming up uh, in case you're not sick of webinars already. Um, you know, but this one's going to be exciting. I'm going to try and get on as well, um, but I haven't eaten dinner yet. Um, and, but
But if you go to Diversity in Aquatics uh, Facebook page, just search Diversity in Aquatics on Facebook. If you're not connected already, you should probably follow that page. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see another um, webinar that starts at eight o'clock. I don't have all the details right in front of me right now, but um, but yeah, it's another. Um, it's going to be live on Facebook. Um, so you can navigate to that page and be able to watch it live. Um, yeah, it's exciting. So, um, yeah, so we got about eight minutes to, to answer any other live questions. Um, I'm scrolling here, um, to see, um, we don't have, we only have about 30 participants left. So if you want to, um, just kind of unmute and, and chime in, uh, hopefully not everybody tries to do it at once. I don't think that's the case, but go ahead. Arvin, my friend, how are you, sir? Hey, great, Ernest. Hey, hey I'm really happy that, uh, you know, I was able to make it. I was actually working <laughs> later this evening and uh, I missed part of it. it. Will it be on YouTube as well, um, any of this? Yeah, that's a great question. And thanks for bringing that up. Um, for those of you who are only able to catch a portion of it, um, or you want to share this with others, um, because you registered to be able to be part of this webinar, you will be emailed a link to a recording of it, um, probably in the next 24 to 48 hours, give it a day or two if you can. And uh, we'll make sure that link gets out to all the registrants for you guys to share um, yeah, and rewatch if you want. Oh, that's <laughs> or, share, or share or share with uh, with your friends um, and colleagues. So um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Arvin. Uh, hope you're yeah. doing well. Yes, things are going well, and I learned so much this evening from what I was able to uh, listen to. Uh, I really respect you and uh, your colleague in all your endeavors, and I really get what you mean about each person's unique approach to uh, pursue what they really want to do. That's, uh, that's a great piece of information because uh, I'm not getting any younger, but I, I still have the capacity to learn and, you know, I, I, I still want to pursue uh, more learning and, and I appreciate the avenues that you guys have traveled um, to acquire your learning and i you know i i'm impressed you guys did awesome i appreciate it yeah no worries and uh you bring up a good point arvin like you're you're never too old to learn like the i feel like the learning journey never ends um i'm in a unique position where i'm i'm the age that i'm at right now and i'm i'm in you know freshman and sophomore level classes at, at florida <laughs> tech with with 18 and 19 year olds who have like zero <laughs> lived experience in, in a lot of cases. There, there are a few other non-traditional students that I've been networking with, other veterans, other people who, you know, um, second career starts, things of that nature, but we're obviously the exception to the norm. And so that's that's been an experience, but one that um, has been really helpful and insightful um, for me to be in a simultaneous position of learning academically while teaching uh, about lived experience, um, you know, uh, in that in that dual role. So it's been it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, and, you know, uh, that can be you if, if you if you want it to be, I'm not saying like, go to school to do this, if you know, if you want to do that. And that's, that's part of the non traditional path that, that we have had um, in our careers. And, 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 you know, conventional schoolwork has been part of it, um, for us to be able to do what we do. But I'm in a position now where I'm uh, a freshman in college, I don't, I still don't have any scientific credentials, but I've been able to build out what I have through seeing the value of my lived experience. Um, yes. And, uh, and, 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 and continue to having a humble mind about um, never not learning enough, never thinking that I've learned enough exactly. to just be a sponge and absorb more. For sure. Anybody else? Thanks to Arvin for sharing. Appreciate it. You're welcome. An SDK. Hey, Jules, how are you? So awesome to see you, you and Michael. I just, I can't. Between this time and Diversity in Aquatics, last amazing, oh my gosh, you all just hit out of the park and I wish I lived next door to you and I could come 
hit you up and rap to you from like a balcony or something because you <laughs> I am so jazzed and so amped I'm a youth athletic coach the thing is I want to hopefully um, network with everyone because the additional resource I have access to is the oldest and top climate change research facility in the world Scripps Institution of Oceanography it's in my backyard I'm the docent there we have an entire dive shop we have a dive shop that held um Army DUKVZ uh, amphibious assault equipment. Actually, it set some of the diving standards all over the world. And we just had our second ever uh, Black Surf Week this past year. I want to expand that into uh, Black surfing, Indigenous surfing, BIPOC surfing, and um, obviously a scuba as well. Um, so yeah, so I just want to say if anyone wants to um, hit me up with that, if we can provide resources on the UCSD level. The other thing is we have outdoor pools, we have outdoor recreations. Um, and so these are resources that do not, as you know, like come lightly, but I'm here to like collaborate, um, learn anyone that wants to volunteer with a strategic plan. I've been doing nonprofit for a minute. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to Diversity Aquatics. Thank you to both of you. I leave Diversity Aquatics webinars amped. You both did such a wonderful job. I'm gonna, I'm typing as we're talking and thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, my email is jacksonjewels at gmail. Um, if you wanna hit up about Coastal Defenders or more importantly, any ways that we can support you through UCSD. I would love to find ways to collaborate. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll definitely be following up with you um, in being more involved in our scuba council around um, the structure you've built out and the resources you've been able to leverage and see if we can build a model that we can take to other institutions, other universities, including and especially Florida Tech right in my backyard um, to build out those programs because colleges and universities have historically provided the, the, the most access to scuba um, at a subsidized level, if not a free level um, for, for a long time now. And so thank you so much for sharing all that. That's awesome. Um, go ahead and drop your email address in the chat for other people to hit you up as well, if you haven't already. Absolutely, we'll do. And, and we also um, just launched a maritime archaeology department as well. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That's that's super exciting. Yeah, write um, your email so I know how to spell the jewels. <laughs> uh, J J U L E S. Oh, it's L E S. Okay. Yeah, J U L E S. But yeah, she'll put her email in her chat in the chat. Okay. Um, yeah, she's she's an awesome person. Coastal defenders. Um, on Instagram, doing some really cool things. Um, obviously held up by COVID like, like a lot of us are, but um, mm -hmm. still some uh, unique opportunities. Uh, the silver lining to the pandemic is, is for us to be able to network and build infrastructures behind the scenes so that when people start venturing back out into the public, when it's safe to do so, um, these programs will hopefully be in place to some degree for people to start taking advantage of almost immediately. So it gives an opportunity for us to be able to network build um, and create uh, new opportunities. Um, yeah, um, let me put my email address. Um, Miriam has put it a few times. It's just scuba at diversityinaquatics.org. Um, Michael has shared his uh, email as well. Um, I, I promise uh, I will answer every single message that um, that comes up because I love sharing information. I love building. I love networking. Networking is single-handedly um, the 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 skill set. If I had to pick one that I have had through the army and through you know my lived experience that has helped me to be in the in the position I am now. So if you have any ideas, I'm always willing to to listen and um, and see how we can build together. So. Um, thank you to Diversity and Aquatics for hosting this webinar. Thank you to Michael for his uh, incredible like uh, insight into his life and his journey and what he has done. Um, this is, I've learned a lot um, and hopefully you've learned a little bit from me as well in exchange. And so, um, you know, and to the audience, thank you so much for joining us um, and, and, and donating your valuable time to, to be with us and learn more about these uh, adventures and, and how we can create a better future for ourselves and for the planet. Um, Michael, any last thoughts? Yeah, um, once again, thank you, Miriam, for letting me be a part of this. Thank you, Anesti, for asking me to be a part of this. Um, and like Anesti said, thank you, thanks everyone for attending this and showing your support um, and listening to my terrible public speaking skills. <laughs> I'm and, still sharpening uh, mine, homie, it's all good. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and, and for being a part of this and taking time out of your day to, uh, to just be here. So thanks a lot again. Um, look forward to seeing you guys again in another webinar, um, if it happens. <laughs>
Yeah, and so we, we should be we should be um the one next month too. So yeah, so we have our convention coming up. We're gonna be definitely doing um a panel discussion there. I'm still working out the details of that. Um, but we're I'm looking to make this way more active. So you're gonna get email follow-ups from us as registrants of this webinar around how you can get more involved in scuba council and some of the things we have going on. And to just come to the table and pitch your own ideas. Like we love brainstorming um, and pulling action items from, from all that brainstorming. That's that's really the process that we're going through right now. So um, thank you all again, really appreciate it. Um, hope you have a wonderful and safe evening and happy holidays to everybody. And uh, don't catch COVID. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you.